Hi, this is Sally Morgan, holistic physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T Touch practitioner for animals and people. This is Tristan, he's a corgi, and we're here for another episode of Conversations with a Corgi. What do you think, Bess? It's not snowing today, but it's cold and it's going to get windy. I have to tape up my front door. It has a bit of a gap where it meets the house on the front deck, and if I don't tape that up, oh, it's really cold. Anyway, Tristan is wearing a flag bandana, and it's not because it's the 4th of July. It's because today we're going to continue our talk about jobs that different kinds of dogs have, and we are going today to talk about dogs in the military. Dogs have fulfilled really important roles in the military for years, starting really um, as early as 600 BC, but really around World War II is when dogs started to be recognized for the work they do um, in war. And dogs do lots of different things. They can do bomb detection with sniffing. They can, uh, initially they were retrieving people and identifying where they were after a battle on the front lines. Um, they can smell gases. They can alert when there's an incoming um, force from the other side. So dogs do a lot of important things in combat. And dogs have been part of combat in the United States in every conflict since the beginning of the United States, but they weren't really recognized, as I said, until World War II. Um, in the earlier conflicts, dogs worked as message carriers, um, but nowadays they do lots of different things. And Puppies start at a very young age to get their training to work in the military. As we talked about with search and rescue dogs, these really highly specialized skills need to be developed in the dog from its earliest days of life. And so there are actually people in the military who are called puppy development specialists, and they work with puppies um, to train working dogs for every single branch of the service. And the program at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, provides most of these dogs to the U.S. forces. And they work with carefully selected puppies from about seven months of age and help the dogs develop social skills that will get them ready for the jobs they have to do later in their lives, which can be really, really difficult. Um, and dogs have accompanied field units in all kinds of terrible situations. Um, as I said, back to World War II, and dogs were sent over across the Pacific um, to Japan to help work with Marines over there. And many, many uh, veteran dogs have been honored for their work in the military. One of them after World War II was a dog named Chips who was part German Shepherd. And he worked in Germany, France, Africa, Sicily, all of that in the Army's 3rd Infantry Division. And he was trained as a sentry dog. And he once um, broke loose from his handlers and attacked an enemy machine gun nest in Italy and forced 10 enemy soldiers to surrender. That's a pretty serious job for a dog. He was later wounded and they gave him a distinguished service cross, a silver star and a purple heart, which is a lot for a dog. And later that was all revoked because there's an, there was at the time an army policy preventing official commendation of animals. And certainly many horses have also been worthy of those commendations. Some of the dogs that have been working in war um, include a dog named Stubby, who was a pit bull mix who started as a stray and then he became quite the famous war dog because he saved an entire company during a sarin gas attack in World War I. And he fought in several campaigns, was wounded a couple of times, and saved a lot of people's lives. He got to go to the White House and meet three different presidents and then uh, General Persing um, in 1921 gave him a medal and pinned it on his jacket and his remains are still on display at the Smithsonian. And then the other dog that I didn't know until I started researching this was a war veteran is Rin Tin Tin. He was a famous dog during World War I. 
he had been working with the Germans. And after a battle, um, an American soldier found him and rescued him, a guy named Lee Duncan. And he brought Rin Tin Tin home. And of course, he became the German shepherd that we know of um, screen stardom. <laughs> and he became one of the early dog movie stars way before Lassie. And of course, the Marines are known for their mascot, the English Bulldog. Um, their first mascot was a bulldog named Jiggs, who worked with the Marines in 1922 and then quickly climbed through the ranks, becoming a sergeant major by 1925. And he died in 1928, and the Marines cer certainly missed him. Another interesting thing is that 85% of the working dogs in the military in the United States are actually bred in Germany and the Netherlands. And part of that is that a lot of the dogs they use are Belgian Malinois, which come from a lot of them in Holland. They're smaller, lighter, quicker German Shepherd. And then of course, Labradors as well. And, and the traditional German Shepherds. So they have been breeding dogs for the military for hundreds of years in Holland and in Germany. And so these bloodlines are particularly well suited to this work. And that's one reason we get dogs from overseas. Of course, in Texas, at that training facility, they are starting to breed more dogs there um, and develop their own lines. But so far, 85% of the dogs have been coming from overseas. And as I mentioned the other day, the average lifespan of a military dog in service is seven to eight years. And it wasn't until pretty late that dogs that served in the military were not euthanized after their service. Really, all the way up until 2000, um, dogs that served in the military, when they were done their service, they were euthanized. And then, um, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but there was a law passed that they could be adopted by their handlers. And many, many war veterans are reunited with dogs they worked with and have a very deep, close relationship with the dogs that they work with. And certainly nowadays, uh, for the last 15 years for sure, um, the veteran who worked with the dog has the first option to adopt the dog. They know the dogs, they understand the dogs, they understand the dog's needs, and there certainly is research that veterans who get to keep and adopt the dogs that they worked with in the military do better when they come back into regular American culture out of that very traumatic environment of being in war. And just in two years, um, many of the dogs adopted, there were 1,312 dogs adopted out to families that had been in the military or military families. Um, and also a large number of dogs, 252 um, in that two year period were adopted out to law enforcement agencies. And certainly dogs that have been in the military have a lot of specialized skills that could be really valuable to someone working in law enforcement. And they aren't, as we thought, all German Shepherds, but there are other breeds as well, the Labrador Retriever, and the U.S. Navy SEALs in particular, like the Belgian Malinois, it's a breed it's like the German Shepherd. They're compact and they have an incredibly keen sense of smell, as do all dogs. And because they're a little smaller than a German Shepherd, you can parachute with them. And if you look online, there are pictures of veterans parachuting with a dog strapped to his chest. There are pictures of dogs climbing very steep ladders and pictures of dogs in just every kind of situation you can imagine. Um, that, you know, climbing mountains and things, um, rappelling down ropes with their handlers. I mean, you need a, an agile, healthy dog to do this work. Interestingly, only about 50% of the dogs that go in for military training actually make it. They have to undergo a very thorough assessment before they're chosen because they have to, first of all, have a very keen sense of smell and they have to be highly motivated and they also have to be physically very, very fit and healthy. They cannot have hip dysplasia or any kind of um, other uh, orthopedic issue for sure. And military dogs have to be trained to attack on command. And they have said in various places that some puppies, many puppies are disqualified from the program because they have extreme stress when they're asked to bite a human. And that is a very interesting thing to me because this is how 
dogs have been you know selectively bred for centuries to bond with us and to be with us and that if they are asked to bite a human and they are exhibiting high levels of stress that just goes to show you how innate it is for them to be partners with us and to not want to bite us <laughs> so it's a very fine line when they're selecting these dogs for military work that they be able to bite on command but that they also are um, still friendly for the handler to work with and that they also have that high motivation to find really they use Kong toys to train a lot of the dogs to sniff for IEDs so the dog has to really love his Kong and be super motivated to find it and not every dog has that drive to find one particular toy so um, they have to really want their Kong because that is the reward that's going to be their quote paycheck for every activity they do for the next years that they're in the military. So it's really important. Um, and of course, the praise from the handler is critical to the success of training a dog to do military work. And many people who have handled dogs in the military have said, in fact, that their own personal emotions and fears and anxieties run right down the leash to the dog and this is something people in T-Touch certainly have been talking about for years. And uh, there are some famous dog training books called The Other End of the Leash, in fact. And it's really important that we, again, because of the military, understand our relationships with our dogs and our connections with them. If you are a person in the military and you are doing a very sensitive job uh, doing bomb detecting and you have a high level of anxiety, that will translate to the dog and it may impair his ability to do his job. So working with these dogs to, is a real skill and a real learned ability to stay calm, to provide the kind of support that the dog needs to do his job really, really well. And it's important that when you're working with a dog that you don't really let him see that you might be having a bad day. But because of their keen sense of smell, just the slightest change in our body and emotional chemistry can really send a big hint to the dog that you're not having a good day. And of course, lots of these dogs do great in uh, law enforcement work after they get out of the military. And that has been a great resource for law enforcement agencies to be able to work with these dogs. And when a dog is lost in the military, um, they have a particular ceremony they do for the dog. It is a great loss to everyone. And it is rare that these dogs are um, injured doing their jobs, but occasionally a dog is killed by an IED, um, an explosive device that went undetected or that he got a little too close to when he was finding another one. And um, military veterans have said this is a terrible loss, um, like losing a comrade um, or a teammate, and that it's just very, very difficult. And often the families, well, sometimes the families of a lost veteran um, will adopt the dog that that veteran was working with and give that dog a home. And that is a wonderful connection to someone you've lost in the military. I mean, dogs just provide so many um, myriads of benefits um, through their work in the military. You know, being with a family of a lost veteran is really significant. And then the dogs are honored by the entire squad. Feeding dishes are symbolically placed upside down and a poem called Guardians of the Night is read in the honor of the dogs that have been lost, which was reminding me of particular poems that I have read when I have lost horses and dogs and rabbits. So it's a, and in fact, in my new deck of animal connection cards, one of the cards is about reading poems with your animal. And part of that is to identify poems like this that are so meaningful that it can help you when you lose your dog and help you create and maintain a connection with that dog throughout your time with him. And of course, like human veterans, dogs also get PTSD. And it wasn't until just the last couple of years that canine PTSD was recognized by the military, but now it's being taken very seriously. And some of the symptoms in a dog that is um, having PTSD includes hypervigilance, an increased startle response, attempts to run away or escape, withdrawal, changes in rapport with the handler, 
and problems performing jobs that they've been trained to do. For instance, a bomb sniffing dog who can't focus on sniffing bombs anymore. And these are very similar to the symptoms that our human veterans have when they have post-traumatic stress. And sometimes dogs can come back and other times they have all of these issues and they will need a specialized home and specialized care with really experienced dog people in order to work through some of the issues that these dogs have. I mean, it is so stressful for them to be in such a stressful environment. And lots of people um, report the emotional benefits of having a dog around when they're in the military is uh, priceless. And in fact, a good bomb detection dog is estimated to be valued at over $150,000. So these dogs are really important and vital. And a lot of the dogs have learned how to jump from planes and rappel down buildings and do all kinds of interesting and dangerous work. Um, and then of course the Navy SEALs, which is an elite special operations team, they do all of these things, parachuting and climbing buildings and things um, with their Belgian Malinois teammates. And in fact, some of the dogs were there when they found Osama bin Laden. And interestingly, it was not until November of 2000 that military working dogs um, were able to retire. Prior to that, they were euthanized or abandoned where they had worked. And that was just what a horrible way to treat them, but they were considered military surplus. And thank God for all of the new research on dog intelligence and animal emotions, because, you know, it's unthinkable now that you would have a dog doing these valuable services and that you would just abandon them or euthanize them, which in many cases probably was nicer. Um, so thank God President Clinton in 2000 passed something called Robbie's Law so that military working dogs um, which had been military surplus equipment unfit to adjust to civilian life um, that now, in fact, handlers and families can adopt military animals at the completion of their service. And as I've mentioned before, there's a wonderful movie called Megan Levy that you can get on demand on TV. It was out, I don't know, six months ago about um, a war veteran woman, Megan, who worked with a bomb sniffing dog who was injured and she was too. And she fought really hard to get that dog released to her um, personal care when the dog was released from the military because that the idea still is that underlying all of this that the dog should be euthanized and he can't be a good pet. Well, of course they can't be a good pet like any of us would have a pet, but they can be with their handler and with highly skilled families and with people that are willing to make the effort to understand and make, and take care of their health needs. And so her dog was slated to be put down because he was considered vicious and unpredictable. Um, but he had a lot of pain and injuries and that's why he was vicious and unpredictable. And certainly from my work as a Tellington T-Touch practitioner, I can see that you know, any animal that is vicious and unpredictable generally has an underlying problem with pain or major systemic distress from food or other emotional things going on with that dog. So thank God Megan was able to get her dog home and he worked with her for a while um, in law enforcement and now she's a, uh, a vet tech in North Jersey and her dog since has passed on. But thank God, you know, she's just another example of the work that people do to maintain their relationships with their dogs and to honor them for what they have done. Another interesting thing about dogs in the military is that they always have one rank higher than their handler. And this has been going on since World War I. And partially why they did this is to make it so you, you as a handler will respect the dog and keep the dog um, from being mistreated. So kind of interesting that dogs have a higher rank just to, and honestly, they have saved so many lives. These dogs do amazing, amazing work with great enthusiasm and love. And we are so lucky that in 2000, that law was passed that these dogs can go home and retire and have good lives with the people that they have grown close to and loved. And any of us who has done any kind of competitive thing with dogs, you know how much they do that just for you. It's not because the dog's having fun going to a dog show. 
yeah, lots of dogs have fun doing agility, but would they do it at the competitive level that they do if we weren't there encouraging them and being so happy when they do it? I don't think so. I think that dogs really do a lot of what they do because they love us. And so thank God we can honor these military dogs and their incredible roles, um, keeping us safe all these years. They are just amazing. And so now my comments are coming in sideways. Let me see. So grateful military working dogs are now allowed to be with their people. That's true, Wendy. And I can't really read what Danny wrote. Something about a German Shepherd. Um, I can't see it because it's sideways, but they are, she says that they are very smart. And yes, German Shepherds are very smart. I love German Shepherds. I would have had a German Shepherd years ago <laughs> if my family would have let me have a German Shepherd. Um, they're great guard dogs. I think the biggest drawback with German Shepherds is finding one that doesn't have a lot of health problems. And uh, certainly there are many lines available now that don't have health problems. And, you know, you have to do some searching to find one. But, um, and these military dogs, of course, have uh, really strong structures and uh, not very many health issues except for those they've earned on the battlefields. So thanks for joining us today for this episode of Conversations with a Corgi, where we have talked about dogs in the military um, as part of our long series now on dogs and their jobs. And we've talked about therapy dogs and comfort dogs and uh, crisis response dogs and service dogs and canine good citizens and all kinds of dogs. And we'll be wrapping this series up as the week progresses. And I'm hoping to be able to announce the availability of my animal connection cards. And we are certainly going to do an episode about my sister's new book. I'm waiting for my copy to arrive, which should be today, so that you can see it. And I can tell you more about the specifics in it that might be relevant to your dogs. So thanks for joining us today. Um, and we will be back tomorrow. Biscuit, what do you have to say today? Anything? He has a really cute little dog military outfit that says Sergeant Dog on it. But with his winter coat, which believe me is fluffy, it was so tight on him. He didn't, he looked overstuffed. So that's why he's wearing his flag bandana. Biscuit's going to give a little corgi high five to the military dogs. Hey, thanks guys. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Stay warm.